Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, FOVC FY 2024 Grantee Orientation, Putting the Pieces Together, hosted by the Office for Victims of Crime. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Joel Hall, Deputy Director with OVC, uh, to begin the presentation. Joel. Hello, everybody. I'm going to be on the camera for a few seconds, but I just wanted to introduce you to myself. My name is Joel Hall. I'm Deputy Division Director for SVRD State Victim Resources Division. I want to welcome you to our Putting the Pieces Together Grantee Orientation Program. I'll turn the camera off right now so don't take up too much bandwidth. This webinar is designed for FY24 grantees and other OVC grantees, new staff included, that would like a refresher um, at, or just the basic skills that you will need to understand your grant. But all are welcome. These are skills that you will need no matter how long you've been a grantee, and it's always great to talk about them again. The primary goal of today's presentation is to give you the basic level of skills to understand how to navigate your award. We want to inform participants and provide the knowledge and resources to successfully manage new OVC victim grants awards. As I said before, and I see some names of people who have been OVC grantees for a while, that's great. We welcome all, and hopefully you may learn something new as well. Um, it's important to note that this is a limited training and not in exclusive of all aspects and knowledge that you will need. You will notice as we go through many of the different slides, there'll be links either in the chat box or within the slides for additional trainings. Um, Just Grants has wonderful resources, either toolkits, guides, resource manuals, and videos. So we're trying to link all of those tools within many of these different slides. We can't spend the whole time or this training would be two days long. So this way we're trying to give you a general knowledge and understanding of what you will need to basically navigate your awards on a basic level. It's your job to then take that knowledge that we give you and expand it by learning more and accessing the resources that we provide so that you can adequately work with your grant manager, OVC, and um, your agency to better uh, facilitate this award. Next slide. Um, learning objectives, understand OVC's goals, requirements, and expectations for your award. Understand OVC's mission and OJP's role. Know how to locate, understand, and navigate DOJ systems. Know specific elements of the OVC grant award and helpful resources and support. Also be aware that this is just a orientation, a one-on-one -on -one grant training specific for, that really encompasses all areas that every grant with OVC will need. Additionally, there may be additional um, new, or, new orientation um, webinars that may be um, assigned to you through your division. So if you work for human trafficking or another agency, there may be additional orientations that gets into specifics about your awards and what's specifically about that. But this one specifically for kind of understanding the basic needs. And just be aware, I'm sure your division um, or the different um, grant managers will present and make you aware of any other type of divisional training that might be out there. Uh, next slide. All right, so helping to understand OVC. Now, OVC is under the Office of Justice Programs. This is a very large agency with five primary program offices. We're not gonna go through all of them, but we want you to understand that with those program offices, we also have support offices that helps us do what we do. Um, I'm going to start on the left with OCFO, the Office of the Chief Financial Officer. This is our financial arm of OJP. They're the ones who would help um, process many of the budget requests that you may be doing. There could be monitoring, financial monitoring, um, whenever GAMs go through and different aspects of your grant that will go through. It usually goes through our financial office, which is OCFO. So that's the support office that you probably be most recognizable with. So remember that acronym, OCFO. OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, of course, as their name suggests, they are here to help us understand what our obligations are under federal statute, to make sure that we are being open and inclusive to everybody that we serve. Um, you'll notice many different special conditions in your grant related to OCR, so make sure you pay attention to them. And they also have, you know, their own website that they, if you have questions about some of the requirements that you could contact them directly. Office of General Counsel is kind of like it sounds, it's our legal 
Council, you may not be talking them to directly, but we may be asking questions with them, or maybe there's a particular um, issue that we have to kind of get some guidance on. So they are a very strong support for us. OAM, the Office of Audit Assessment and Management. This is kind of an overreaching part of OJP that basically makes sure that we're following many of the requirements that we're supposed to. It's kind of like an oversight in terms of making sure any audits, assessments, monitoring things are all falling within spec, to make sure that we are all doing things that are required under statute and um, under the VOCA awards. OAG is, um, finally, OAG is the Office of Assistant Attorney General. That is, of course, the office with our Assistant Attorney General that basically runs OJP and makes all the larger decisions. Okay, next slide. And now we're gonna play a slight video, or just a short video on what OBC does. I know many of you are new grantees, and um, you may, this might be your first OBC award, so I want to give you that orientation to what OBC does to get a, a better picture. My, uh, my mother and my brother were murdered uh, in front of me. I was 10. My daughter-in-law looked through the glass and, and her eyes showed horror. And she said, Nana, what's happened to you? And I said, I've been raped. I've been raped. I met a guy at the church and he wanted to be my friend and instead he assaulted me. And I felt very scared. There is behind every case that involves a crime of violence, a victim, a very real human being who has needs and needs to be spoken to and needs to have the system explained to them. The Office for Victims of Crime was created in 1984 to enhance victims' rights and services for all victims across the United States. The Office for Victims of Crime is a federal agency created by Congress that is a part of the Department of Justice it is the government funding agency for crime victims compensation programs and victim assistance programs. The Crime Victims Fund is distributed in a number of ways by the Office for Victims of Crime. Part of it goes to support other federal agencies who are providing services for victims. Part of it goes to support model programs and practices, but the majority of the funding goes to the states. The Office for Victims of Crime is not the provider of services, but they fund states, and then states can subgrant the money out to direct service providers. Each jurisdiction, each state is going to be different. And by distributing the money to the states, they determine where the greatest need is and what the need is. Victim service providers need very specialized programs to reach hard to find victims who are not always assured that they are going to find welcoming and accessible services when they do reach out for help. The Office for Victims of Crime is very committed to the professionalization of the crime victim services field. We do that through developing new programs, through training and technical assistance, and disseminating information about model programs that benefit victims of crime. There's an intentional effort to get everyone together so we know how to share resources, we know how to work together. The Office for Victims of Crime listens to the needs of state administrators for victims' compensation and assistance, and then gives us the tools we need to provide assistance to victims of crime. All right, um, great video. Uh, it's an oldie, but it's still a good one to this day. All right, next slide, Daryl. All right, this is our OVC organizational chart. This just gives you an overview, um, a quick overview of what OVC looks like. Obviously, we have a director, Chris Rose, um, and the principal deputy director, chief of staff, and each one of these divisions 
uh, which we call the first one's OA, Operations, Budget, and Performance Management Division, State Victim Resource Division, which I'm a Deputy Director of, Tribal Division, Human Trafficking Division, and Discretionary Program Division. I'm sure there are representatives probably for most of those down at the bottom, and we welcome you. Uh, next slide. OVC grant types. So OVC has many different kinds of grants. Um, one of our largest ones that we fund are our two formula grants, Crime Victim Assistance and Crime Victim Compensation. I know there are several representatives on this, um, this um, webinar. And that basically gives money directly to the states, the SAAs, to then provide services throughout their state. OVC discretionary grant um, activities. Those are um, kind of like our fill-in in terms of whatever kind of different grants that we may have. There's so many different interesting things that OVC does. Um, I know many of you may be part of that meeting the basic needs um, grant that was recently awarded. So that's kind of what they do. They do with a lot of the national scope training and technical assistance demonstration projects. Basically, it is the types of grants when we try to do innovative and demonstration projects. Tribal Victim Services set aside, TVSSSA. Um, this is our tribal division runs this particular grant and works with so many different of our tribal grantees, um, Alaska Native, Pacific Islanders, many different grants throughout our system. We do some of that through our formula stuff too, but in general, they will work directly with the tribal grantees. And then lastly, but not least, human trafficking discretionary awards. Uh, they basically are the premier organization and division that works with human trafficking throughout the Department of Justice. They have their hands in every aspect, and they have skilled staff and um, complete competency in many of the things that they do related to human trafficking. Okay, next slide. All right, questions. So you're going to notice that after each section, we're going to have a questions box. So every time there's a presenter, there's going to be questions. So we'll be taking questions throughout the different sections, and of course, we'll have questions at the end. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A box on the side about the um, beginning, um, this early part of the presentation. If not, you can wait. <laughs> we have a lot of detailed slides coming up, but I just want to put you in that we're going to be stopping to break for questions in between. And no, the burn grant does not fall under victim assistance. It does fall under discretionary, even though some victims some of our formula team will be managing about six of those burn JAG awards. So it's possible that you may be talking to one of your SVRD staff people, but I think 90% uh, of them will fall under discretionary division. All right. Let's try next slide, and we'll answer questions. If I miss you on this one, we'll get you on the side. You know, we can answer questions. All right. What did you not understand from the presentation and what are you looking for from your grant manager? Um, this is kind of an introductionary question where we're going to ask these things ahead of time so that you can put down what you may not understand yet or what you are looking for. Please type your answer on the side and we will compile those questions. All right, Daryl, I think we can probably end that for right now um, or pull that up. All right, so we got a lot of different answers here. Let's see, how to start a GAM and Just Grants. Well, you're definitely going to learn learn that, or at least be given the resources to help you understand that better. Looking for support and guidance as we learn the grant. Uh, we actually have a great session on what we're going to talk about in regards to what the roles and expectations of the grant manager and what your roles are. Budget revisions, um, we'll go slightly into that. That one, of course, is a complicated one but we will definitely give you some of the skills, reporting requirements for burn JAG awards. Um, yes, um, actually those will probably be the same as any other grants. Overall, um, looking for guidance to do things expected, trainings, reporting requirements, and best ways to track data. We will take care of all of that. Um, reporting requirements, you know, that varies by different um, awards. We uh, have our tools, which we will talk about in terms of how we collect some of that data but every um, grant has a little bit different in terms of um, what they're looking for, and we will talk a little about that in future and slides coming on later on. All right, let's, uh, I think that's it for that poll question. And now I'd like to turn it over to Stacy Phillips. 
Lipsy is a victim justice program specialist, and she will be going over kind of the grants management 101. So much Joel and so excited to see so many people here on this webinar and to walk you through kind of grants management 101. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk through the grants life cycle on this screen. This is a visual of the general stages of OJP grant management, and it really starts out with the award package acceptance and then eventually ends with your award closeout. And so over the next few slides, we're going to provide more information about each stage. So the very first stage is accepting your award or or declining. Um, once you've been notified that you're receiving an award. So this is a two step process in just grants. Step one is your entity administrator should assign the six roles slash participants to the award. And if you're unsure about who to assign for each role, please still assign somebody. We're going to get into that a little bit later. And then step two is that the authorized representative accepts or declines the award. And what's really important is that your authorized representative, that role, that person must have the legal authority to enter into contracts, grants, and cooperative agreements. So above is a workflow that demonstrates the stages of acceptance and what roles are key to each of those stages. And you're gonna get a copy of these slides as Joel said. So as a reminder, the entity administrator is really key in making sure that the right people are assigned to the right roles. So failure to do so can really delay your award acceptance. And also, just a side note, as per the DOJ grants financial guide, the grantee must accept the award within 45 days. Oftentimes, we will see that awards have not been accepted and we later learn that the grantee was having issues. Please make sure to reach out to your grant manager if you are having trouble so that you don't go past that 45 day mark. It's also really important to make sure that you assign these six roles. And like I said before, if you're unsure about who to assign, please assign somebody. Um, each role can have up to six people. The system is, is really set up around these six roles. So it's important to follow the directions when assigning the roles, don't skip steps. And as you, the entity administrator, assign those roles, again, you have to ensure that the users have the authority to carry out the duties that are associated with each of the roles. So I saw someone, uh, Oh, so we're going to, oh, sorry, I apologize. So we're going to walk through how we accept the award. And so you can see here, this is kind of a screenshot of what Just Grants looks like. And you can see that on the right is where you will see where all of the roles are uh, listed, as well as who is assigned to them. And then you can see how your package acceptance is kind of laid out on the left side. Same here again with award acceptance, you'll be able to sit there and see where it's highlighted, who the authorized representative is, and then be able to click accept or decline um, as long as you are assigned that role. And this is just another slide that further walks you through the entity acceptance. And again, really like who is who your agency is, who those roles are, and then really walk you through what you're signing and what you're certifying. So how do you access your funds? So the automated standard application for payments, which you'll hear us refer to as ASAP, is the shared services payment system used by the Department of the Treasury. This replaced the grants payment request system for grant payments. And so all federal agencies enroll their recipient organizations, authorize their payments, and manage their accounts and ASAP. So ASAP is a completely electronic system that federal agencies use to quickly and securely transfer money to recipient organizations. Federal agencies enroll recipient organizations, authorize their payments, and manage those accounts. Recipient organizations then request 
payments from these pre-authorized accounts. Recipient organizations include state and local governments, educational and financial institutions, vendor and contractors, profit and nonprofit entities, as well as Indian tribal organization. Um, if you are new to ASAP, one of the really big important things is to make sure that you enroll in ASAP as soon as possible um, after your SAM.gov e-business point. We also want to make sure that you avoid payment delays, like I said, by enrolling in ASAP as soon as possible. Your business point of contact will receive the invitation and then allow at least 10 business days for the Department of Treasury to enable drawdown of your funds after verifying that the banking details you submitted were valid. So your point of contact can fill all those roles, assign multiple roles to one person, as I said earlier. And then this slide really shows the user roles. You have your head of your organization that approves them. Your financial official will enter all that banking data for receiving payments. And then the authorizing official, the AO, adds the entity short name and payment requester information. One of the things that is really important for you to know is that ASAP is unavailable during month end account reconciliation. And so all DOJ related ASAP accounts are temporarily suspended the last three business days of every month and the last five business days of September to carry out required account reconciliation activities. So what that means in a nutshell is that you cannot access the account. So if you need to draw down funds, you definitely don't want to, to do that during those timeframes because it will go into the following weeks. So we want you to familiarize yourself with the grant award modifications. We call them GAMs. This GAM process is really how we modify details of the award. So all GAMs are initiated in the same basic way. However, each has specific fields and subtypes depending on the information needed for that specific type of GAM. So users can enter information in the GAM save the information, and then return later to complete and submit the GAM. However, once the GAM is submitted, we review it, DOJ reviews it, and sends it as an approved, denied, or change requested notification. The following actions are not treated as GAMs in just grants. So an entity administrator can change the grant award administrator and authorized representative. Again, this is not a GAM. The grant award administrator can submit deliverables for review under performance management. Again, not a GAM. Users can update the grantee name and address on SAM.gov, as well as establish a new unique entity identifier that is also not a GAM. But what are GAMs? So this is another workflow chart that really demonstrates GAMs and the different types of GAMs. So we have project period extension GAMs, we have programmatic GAMs, and we also have financial GAMs. My advice is that you speak with your grant manager before initiating a GAM so that you can ensure you are choosing the right one because getting something change requested after you've worked to put it in the system will be frustrating for you. And so if you work with your grant manager, you can ensure that you're doing it the right way the first time. So how do we initiate a GAM in just grants? As you can see at the top of the award information on the right side, it says grant award modification. And there's a drop down box on the left. And when you select that drop down box, it will give you one of those three GAMs that I just spoke about project period extension, programmatic, or financial. Um, now we're going to move over again through our grant life cycle. And, you know, one of the things we want you to understand is that GAMs and other financial requests are first reviewed by the program office and then by the office of the chief financial officer. So depending on the time of year and the workload, OJP may be busier than others. 
Um, for example, requesting a no cost extension at the last minute may delay your notification of of its approval. And again, I'm kind of going to go back to what I said before, have discussions with your grant managers before you just move forward to do these. The other thing I want us to get across is is oftentimes I think um, there's this process that we forget that this is not just the grant manager that is approving these and then everything is good to go. There's this entire process where it goes through the first line supervisor and then over to OCFO. So there are others in the approval process. So when you do process a GAM, just kind of remember that, that it's not officially approved until you receive that final notice in just grants. So you have different reporting requirements um, as, you're, as you're working through your, your project and your award. These include performance reports, which are semi-annual or annual, depending on your program. Um, you have the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act. You'll hear us refer to that as the FAFADA, if, if that's applicable. Your federal financial reports and then your performance measurement tool. So your performance uh, reports, this performance reporting is integrated into the Just Grant system. All users will complete required reporting directly in Just Grants within each performance report using a performance measure question set. With the FAFADA, this is only applicable to grantees that subaward funds over $25,000. So the FAFADA legislation requires information on federal awards, federal financial assistance, and expenditures that they be made available to the public through a single searchable website, which is www.usaspending.gov. The FAFADA subaward reporting system is the reporting tool federal prime awardees used to capture and report subaward and executive compensation data regarding their first tier subawards to meet the FAFADA reporting requirements. So prime contract awardees will report against subcontract awarded and prime grant awardees will report against subgrants awarded. One of your other reporting requirements is your federal financial report, which we call an FFR. This is a statement of your expenditures associated with a grant. Recipients of federal funds are required to report the status of funds for grants or assistance agreements to the sponsor of the grant using the federal financial report expenditure data. And then last but not least is your performance measurement tool. The PMT collects data for a three month period. Many OVC grants use this system to record performance data, which is then later uploaded into your semi-annual performance report. In some cases, subgrantees will also report into the PMT. So to determine if you need to report into PMT first, please reference your NOFO, your notice of funding for reporting frequencies and performance requirements. You can also uh, connect with your grant manager if you have questions about that as well. So the good stuff, monitoring. OVC actively monitors the status and progress of each cooperative agreement, each grant. Monitoring can include phone discussions or emails, participating in meetings and events, reviewing progress and financial reports, as well as conducting site visits. The purpose of a site visit is to conduct a comprehensive review of program and grant-related financial management systems, policies, records, and documentation to help assess their adequacy and compliance with grant provisions and federal requirements. The role of the grant managers is to review the grant terms, the objectives, conditions, and grantee organization, as well as your key personnel. Contact the grantee to discuss requirements of the grant, monitor grantee compliance with programmatic, administrative, and fiscal requirements of those relevant statutes, regulations, policies, guidelines, and with grantee stated objectives and implementation plans. Also perform desk reviews and or site visits, also ensuring that the data reporting is happening from the grantee, approving your progress reports, approving modifications to your awards, and then possibly even conducting on-site monitoring visits to review the activities of your grant. For cooperative agreements, 
grant managers typically provide additional direction and oversight. There are different ways that OBC monitors your grants, as I just discussed several of them, phone discussions, emails, participating in meetings and events, reviewing progress and financial reports, on-site or remote programmatic and or financial site visits and desk reviews. If you are a cooperative agreement, please get with your grant manager as there is definitely more oversight requirements that can include anything from reviewing your PowerPoints to even approving staffing changes. The purpose of your site visits, and this is part of the monitoring process, it may, your monitoring process may include a site visit. And the purpose of those site visits are to provide technical assistance, to ensure compliance, to do the actual monitoring of your award, and also to learn from you, to learn about your award, possibly work and learn from your partners, your stakeholders, and also um, not for you to forget to, to monitor your subrecipients. So last but not least are award closeouts. You have no later than 120 days after your award end date where you as award recipients must submit all financial performance and other reports as required by terms and conditions of your award. And you may initiate that closeout process. So please keep in mind that the financial reconciliation portion of the closeout often takes three to five days to go through and that your final progress report must be approved by your OBC grant manager before those activities in the closeout are marked as complete. Also note that special condition removal can take three to five days and must be done prior to submitting the closeout package. All the sections of the closeout must be marked complete in order to hit the closeout submission button for a compliant closeout. If the submission is not completed by the due date, the system will automatically generate an administrative closeout that your OBC grant manager will need to complete. If the award has an in-progress grant, grant award modification GAM, it must be resolved before closeout can be submitted. In progress GAMs appear as one of the closeout requirements. So see the award closeout and the pending grant award modification section for additional information on resolving in progress GAMs. So as I said before, you are the one to initiate a closeout. And so when you are ready for that, which can be anywhere from the time of the end of your award up to 120 days, as we said, You'll see on the right side where it has award information and all the way to the right, you'll see the close out section. And that's when you click close out award. So this is that time where if you have questions, this is a great time. If you have not already written them into the chat box, please do so. And I think we have a poll question. So what, oh, are you gonna do that, Gerald, or do I do that? <laughs> No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Take your okay. That's okay. What are the implications of late submissions of your FFR? That's your federal financial report and your performance progress, your progress reports. Is it a freezing of program funds? B impact on future funding considerations, C A and B or D no implications. I'll give everyone a second. Yes, as Tina said, please respond in the polling feature in WebEx. All right, well, let's take a look, Daryl. Okay, so we have everybody that, we have a, a, a lot of people that said A and B, and then we have a lot that did not answer. So either they have lots of questions still, um, ho which hopefully will continue to answer, or they were not, uh, they did not know how to access the poll question. So we'll figure that out. But I'm gonna hand it back to well, I'm going to hand it over to Ramisa. Hey, um, Ramisa, before we get started, I want to go over some of these questions that we have popping up here. I'll just take a few seconds and we'll, we'll readdress some that we haven't talked about before. So, Kareen Bird had um, any advice if our authorized representative has been, has been assigned, I guess, assigned, not signed, but if 
still unable to accept. So talk to your grant manager about that. Number one issue is you haven't signed all of your roles. That tends to be it. So you have to make sure you sign all your roles, but it could be other issues as well. So make sure all GAA financial manager are assigned, and then maybe that might help you um, move on to the next step. If not, talk to your grant manager. Has OVC updated that any GA grant award administrator and the financial manager can submit GAMs? Um, the answer is no. As far as I'm aware of, only the uh, grant award administrator can still assign the GAMs. Unless it's financial, then the financial management person can do it. The financial manager can do FFRs. The GA person can do progress reports. I don't believe that's changed, and I'm on the grant management board, so I don't remember hearing that changing, but if somebody know something, let me know, other staff people on here. Um, do we need to set up ASAP for each new grant or does it carry over from grant to grant? Well, that depends. In general, large um, agencies that have multiple awards with OJP do not need to um, set up separate accounts necessarily. They will actually fall into each account. Now, if you have different, if you're a small organization, and you kind of have just one award here and maybe another award there, it's possible you might have to do that. I would, again, talk to your grant manager or the ASAP has a help desk line. Um, I know some agencies who are on here, formula grantees, have maybe 100 awards, and they actually kind of pops up in there. But generally, um, I have to see, depending on your agency, that you might have to do it individually, but if you're lucky, you don't have to. All right, for time's sake, let's move on. We'll come back to address some of those other questions at the uh, other periods. Okay, great. Thanks, Joe. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning, wherever you may be. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar. So I will start with the next section, which is understanding just grants. Next slide. So this slide talks about just grants, which is the grant application and award management system used by all of the DOJ grant making agencies to include the Office of Community Oriented Policing, known as COPS, the Office of Justice Programs, which is OJP, and the Office on Violence Against Women, which is OVW. The Just Grants web link, justgrants.usdoj.gov, has web content that is linked to five main sections to include the training, resources, user support library, and news updates. So the training resource has self-guided step-by-step -step how to videos on things such as the DOJ grant application process, grant award modifications, closeouts, and other grant related actions to help you manage your DOJ grant. Resources, this is where you can find funding resources for the COPS office, OJP, and OVW and other grant related systems such as ASAP, which is the standard payment system, Grants.gov and SAM.gov. The user support resource is where you can find the help desk contact information and answers to frequently asked questions. The library resource is where you can find and search for how to videos and frequently asked questions by topic or check the glossary of terms for an explanation of terminology used by the DOJ grant making agency. The news and updates. Um, is where you can, um, where it has updates on applying for and managing your DOJ grant. Um, and then the web link um, will be or should have already been dropped in the chat for this slide. Next slide, please. So this slide talks about the Just Grants user roles. There are two common roles in Just Grants. These are the grant award administrator and the financial manager roles. These two individuals will be responsible for uploading and completing grant related documents and engaging with the OVC OJP staff. The program staff do not have a direct role in just grants, but still have an important role as it relates to the grant award. They are the individuals that will be directly impacting the lives of the victims that they serve and recording the important performance measures that will highlight the exceptional work through reporting mechanisms like the performance reports and the PMT data reporting. And for your reference, there are six fundamental roles in the Just Grants that will be highlighted in the next slide. So as you prepare to develop your organization's user roles in Just Grants, you will need to understand the six 
fundamental or foundational roles for users. Additionally, the matrix that you see on the screen will help you understand the scope of the six foundational roles as you determine who should be just grants users in your entity and which roles those users should possess. Also, it is certainly important to know that entities may have multiple just grants users. There is no limit. It's also useful to know that each user can possess multiple roles. Entities determine who possesses what role or roles. Entities can assign users to multiple applications and awards, and each user will have one username and password. So please remember that you will need your username and password to log into the Just Grants system. As it relates to this particular slide, I would also like to mention that the description for each of the Just Grants roles has been provided to give you a better idea of who should possess what role or roles and the duties and responsibilities for each of the user roles. Also, there is a more detailed job aid um, that will probably be dropped in the chat. I think that is another link that should be there. Um, and also, at the end of the training, there should also be, or somewhere within the training, there should be a link for um, the e-learning videos and downloadable PDF job aids to help you um, or help guide you through the system as you become more familiar with Just Grants. Next slide, please. This section in Just Grants will help you in identifying who in your organization has the correct role. Please note that it is very important to ensure that you have the correct individuals in the correct role or roles. Your entity administrator is the only person that can change the user roles to the correct individuals. Please note that your OVC grant manager cannot make those changes. Only your organization's entity administrator can make the appropriate changes. Um, you can access this list that you see on the screen by going into the home page in Just Grants and scrolling down to the entity users option on the left side panel, then by scrolling over to the right to view each of the user roles. Next slide, please. So this slide is your entity document page. This is where the entity administrators can upload documents so that other entities and the Department of Justice users can view and download selected documents for use on specific applications, awards, and monitoring activities. The documents located in this section apply to the entity as a whole or relate to multiple applications and awards. Linked is a video and job aid on how entity administrators manage their entity profiles and user roles, including the four Equal Employment Opportunity Program, known as EEOP user roles, and entity documents that may apply to all applications and awards, such as the indirect cost rate agreements and financial capability questionnaires. This um, video will cover the processes. I'm not sure that we even have a video, but if there is a video um, that's attached or in the link, this video that you see will cover the processes of initially onboarding the entity during the application submission, including information about how Just Grants uses data that you provide to other federal systems as well as entity management specific, such as entity user management and Just Grants and in the Digital Identity and Access Management Directory, better known as Diamond, in that particular system. It will also detail the process for managing planned and unplanned changes to the entity administrator role and discuss where to go for resources and assistance as you navigate in SAM.gov, Diamond, and Just Grants. Next slide, please. So note that the first tab in a funded award is the award package tab. The following sections under this tab were individually agreed to by your authorized representative when accepting the award. Um, and they include the award letter, which is your congratulatory letter, the award information section, which has the recipient's name, address, award amount, et cetera. The project information section, which has the solicitation title, the application number, the awarding agency, and program office. 
Um, there's the financial information section, which is the budget information section. There's also the award conditions. These are the award conditions specific to your particular award. And then there's the acceptance and electronic signature. Um, so note that in these sections, your authorized representative either checked a checkbox stating that the information in each section has been read and understood and or accepted the award with an electronic signature and date. And as a hot tip, which is up in the right hand corner, you can refer to the award management job aid for further guidance on managing your award. Next slide, please. So as it relates to the award conditions, your specific award conditions were determined in the original solicitation. It is important that you remain in compliance with all conditions of the award. Some conditions require document submissions. If this is the case, you will see that indication on this particular screen in just grants. This screen also lets you know if your entity is in compliance with each special condition of the award. Um, and I just want to put a, a special note out there that some of the grantees have asked how to print the award package. If you want to print out your award package so that you can see all of the special conditions in one document, you can go to your actions button, which is in the right hand corner of the award conditions section and select print award page PDF, select that particular option. Next slide, please. So because there are so many award conditions and some of them vary from award to award. I will only highlight the special conditions that we as grant managers are most frequently asked. Note that these are all listed in detail in your specific award document. Um, so today we've grouped um, 11 condition, conditions and on this slide you can see seven of those conditions um, to include the federal regulations, to CFR Part 200 uniform requirements, um, and those are the cost principles on how to use federal funds and manage your award. Um, there's also the required financial management training. That is the DOJ grants financial management training that must be taken by the POC and all financial POCs within 120 days after the award has been accepted and every three years thereafter. Grants versus cooperative agreement. For grants, there's no substantial involvement with the federal agency. However, with the cooperative agreement, there is a substantial involvement between the federal agency or pass-through entity and the grantee. Conferences and trainings, pre-approval and post-reporting. Prior approval must be received for conferences and trainings where DOJ funds are used to host the conferences or trainings. There are also post reporting requirements related to this particular special condition. Suitability determinations. Um, there's a requirement that a criminal background takes place for any employee who may interact directly with minors under the age of 18. That background check must take place six months before the employment and every five years thereafter. Publications developed with grant funds. There is a disclaimer that must be um, written or placed in the brochures or pamphlets um, if federal funds are used to create that particular product. Final budget clearance. A final budget clearance must be issued prior to drawing down funds. However, depending on the program or award, you may be able to draw down a percentage of the awarded funds for personnel, fringe benefits, mandatory travel, or things of that nature prior to receiving the final budget clearance. So please also take note of the hat tip on the screen regarding the upcoming two CFR training that is scheduled for Tuesday, October 22nd. The link to this training will be dropped in the chat. Next slide, please. So now we'll talk about the additional four special conditions um, which are highlighted on this screen. The first one is the limited English proficiency for this condition. You must certify that limited English proficiency persons have meaningful access to the services under your program or program. Meaningful access may entail providing language assistance services, including oral and written translation when necessary. And also the U.S. Department of Justice has issued guidance for grantees to help them comply with Title VI 
there's a Title VI requirement. This guidance document can be accessed on the internet at www.let.gov. Consultant rates. The consultant rate must not exceed $650 per day or $81.25 per hour. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> if so, a detailed justification must be submitted to and approved by the OJP program office prior to obligation or expenditure of such funds. The next one is key personnel clause, which is personnel changes. The project director and or any other key program personnel designated in the application shall be replaced only for compelling reasons. Successors to key personnel must be approved by OJP and such approval is contingent upon submission of appropriate information, including but not limited to a resume. Changes in a program or changes to the program personnel other than key personnel require only notification to OJP and submission of resumes unless otherwise designated in the actual award document. Copyright and data rights. There's a lot that goes with this one. This is where the recipient acknowledges that OJP reserves a royalty-free, non-exclusive and irrevocable license to reproduce, publish or otherwise use and authorize others to use in whole or in part including in connection with derivative works for federal purposes um, for one, um, for any work subject to copyright developed under an award or subaward at any tier and two, any rights of copyright to which a recipient or subrecipient at any tier purchases ownership with federal support. The recipient also acknowledges that OJP has the right to one, obtain reproduce, publish, or otherwise use the data first produced under any such award or sub-award, and two, to authorize others to receive, reproduce, publish, or otherwise use such data for federal purposes. Data includes data um, as defined in the Federal Acquisition Regulation, which is the FAR, provision 52.227. Um, it is the responsibility of the recipient and of each sub-recipient at any tier, if applicable, to ensure that the provisions of this condition, of this particular condition, um, are included in any sub-award at any tier under the award. So with all said, if you have any questions about any of the 11 award conditions just mentioned or any of the conditions within your particular award, it is important to discuss those with your grant manager. Next slide, please. Programmatic reporting. Um, as a grantee, you are required to submit performance reports. The performance management tab in Just Grants is where you will find all performance reports for your award. Performance reports can be edited and submitted from within an award as well as from the dashboard. The status of each report is also visible in this particular section. Please note that delinquent reports can result in withholding of funds, so it is utterly important that you remain current in submitting your performance reports in a timely fashion. Additionally, on the right panel of this screen is where you can find the open assignments section that provides a link to open performance reports that are due for the upcoming reporting period or periods. Next slide, please. As it relates to performance reports, again, there are due dates and those due dates may vary. For some awards, the performance reports are due at the end of the calendar year, generally around December 30th. For other awards, the performance reports are due quarterly and semi-annually. For guidance on how often performance reports should be submitted for your award, please consult with your grant manager for clarification on specific grant requirements. So there is a hat tip here on the screen, which basically says that Just Grants will automatically suspend funding and your ability to draw down all funds from ASAP one day after the report is due. Also, it is just as important to know that it may take two to three days for ASAP to allow drawdowns after your performance report is submitted. That said, as stated previously, it is important 
to submit your performance reports on time. Next slide, please. So note that you can view all federal financial reports known as FFRs in this tab. Just like a delinquent performance report, a delinquent FFR will result in a suspension of funds. So I encourage you to stay current with submitting your reports. FFRs are also assigned to financial to the financial manager associated with your award and appear on that person's homepage. Notice that all active FFRs are also available as links on the right side of the screen. Again, I would like for you to take a, a look at the hat tip that's here um, on the screen, which says that FFRs are cumulative, meaning that if you have a correction to make, you can make that correction in the next report by editing um, that report, either by adding or subtracting the required amount. So it's important to know that the FFRs, the reporting for those are now, um, that reporting is now cumulative. Next slide, please. So here you can see the FFR reporting period, the actual due dates, and the time frame of when the funds will be frozen if not reported on time. So remember to file every quarter, regardless of whether or not any expenditures were made, reflect actual funds spent, not your drawdown amounts from the federal government. You also want to remember to document all allowable costs incurred at the grantee and sub-recipient levels. You want to remember to report program and sub-recipient expenditures. Um, also be mindful of reporting program income as the cumulative amount, not the quarterly amount. Remember to include the correct indirect cost rate and or base approved by your cognizant federal agency. You want to specify the indirect cost rate type, meaning provisional, final, de minimis, or fixed. You want to report all program income earned, expended, and unexpended throughout the project period. You want to include any matching funds, and you also um, should remember that the first FFR submitted should cover the time from the actual start date of the award to the end of the calendar quarter. Next slide. So this page shows you if your award has received a budget clearance. More specifically, um, you can find the status of the budget under the award details link by scrolling down in the middle of the page under the project budget summary section. If the budget has been cleared by OCFO, you should see the wording final budget clearance highlighted under the project budget summary header. Next slide, please. So if an award is issued with a conditional budget clearance and changes are needed, the DOJ financial grants manager initiator will create a, a budget clearance GAM and a uh, change request GAM to the entity grant award administrator, which is the GAA, who would then access the GAM from their My Work list. When the GAM is displayed, it will contain one of the following main budget structures, it will be in the form of either a web-based budget, a web-based supplemental budget, a supplemental budget within an attachment, or as an attachment budget such as an Excel workbook. Once the GAA makes the necessary changes to the budget and submits the budget clearance GAM, the GAM is then routed through the DOJ approval process. Um, I would also like to point out that disallowed costs can be found in the DOJ financial guide or in the program solicitation. So please take a look at the guide or solicitation when creating your budget. Also, as you can see on the screen, is a screenshot of the Grant Award Modification Budget Clearances Job Aid that provides users with the step-by-step -step instructions for editing the budget once the budget clearance GAM has been changed requested. Additionally, this guide provides instructions for editing web-based and attachment budgets once the budget clearance GAM has been issued. Next slide, please. Just the grants resources. So each one of the links that you, resources that you see on the screen should have a link there. Um, these resources are important in Just Grants. There is also a, a training page 
um, that can help you to understand better the requirements of each section previously, um, as previously discussed in this webinar thus far. Some of the links have already been provided in the presentation, but are summarized here for your convenience. Um, so at your leisure, please take the time to learn more about these resources by viewing the Just Branch training videos. Next slide, please. So All this right. brings us. All right, so we got some questions here. Uh, Maurice, I'm gonna go over real quickly because we're running a little behind. So um, <clears throat> uh, let me go over some of the easier ones and then we'll touch back, back with some of those towards the end. Um, <clears throat> one common one is which user grant, you, what just grants user roles can be assigned to the same individuals? Technically, they all can be assigned to the same individual. Um, you know, some organizations are very large, some are very small. It is a little concerning when the entity administrator authorized rep and all of them are the same, but some organizations might have the, the GA person the same or the authorized person the same because it's a small organization. So technically, some can be um, overlapped. You might have the same person as the financial manager as well for a smaller grant. Um, have grant managers been assigned? They should have been. If you look on your award detail documents, uh, you should see the grant manager right next to the GAA's person's name. Um, if that's not the case, then you can, um, it should come up shortly. Um, um, are progress report templates available or will it be online? So depending on the particular grant, um, if you're or if you are actually filling in that through the PMT performance management tool, that's already pre-populated. So those templates will be available. You can always print them out ahead of time, but you can fill those out. So um, sometimes there might be performance measures in just grants, and those are also templated out. So you don't usually have just where you're just writing free, um, free and usually will be some deliverables and objectives um, and performance measures that may be within that. So let's move on to the poll. All right, Marisa, you can take over the poll. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. So here's a poll question. The question reads, where can you find your award notice of funding opportunity? A, in ASAP, B, in Just Grants, C, contact OCFO, or D, in the DOJ financial guide? And we'll give you a few seconds to answer the question. All right, Daryl, pull it up. In just okay. grants. Yeah. Most people got that correct. In just grants, just in just grants is the correct answer. So for the sake of time, um, I will move forward in the um, webinar and turn it over to my colleague Janet Robson. Thank you, Ramisa. Hi, I'm Janet Ralpson. I'm a tribal grants management specialist and so excited about being here with you all this afternoon. I'm going to talk about understanding your grant a little bit better. Um, so when can your project work begin? So in order for your project work to begin, there are several steps you have to take um, before your work starts. One of them and one of the most important ones that can hold up um, your work is making sure that you are closing out your withholding on any type of special conditions. So um, it will already be listed in Just Grants under your conditions. It'll show whether or not you're in compliance. And if there is a hold amount, it will take you working with your grant manager um, and sometimes there are docu um, documents needed, but we'll talk about that. Um, also, you have to receive a final budget clearance. Um, so remember, in some cases, um, well, you have to get the budget clearance. There are some cases where funds will be allowed um, to be spent, um, but it depends on which grant um, you were awarded under. And you also have to take the financial management training. So the OJP financial management training is offered. Um, there are several different ways to do this. Um, and they are designed for individuals who are responsible for the financial administration of discretionary and formula grants. 
um, awarded from the federal um, grant and aid programs. Um, so this can be accomplished through the online grants financial management training, or it could also be in person, but it must be completed within 120 calendar days from the date that you accepted the award. All grant award administrators and all financial managers are required. Also, be um, the hot tip today is uh, be mindful and be careful of any staff transitions. Often we find that if there's been a new hire or someone's been replaced and they haven't completed the training, they will need to do that. So that should be an absolute start to um, an absolute start to um, if you have somebody starting new. So let's talk about understanding your notice of funding opportunity. It's also a key to your success because this really um, explains to you um, the nuances in your grant. So and where can you find those? Um, you can also you can find them on our OVC um, website. Uh, the link also is placed in the chat. So. OVC has two types of um, federal funding grants and cooperative agreements. The main difference between the two is the level of involvement from the federal government. Grants is a financial award from the federal government to a recipient, such as state or local government, tribal governments. And the purpose of the grant is to support a public purpose and the federal grant government's involvement is usually minimal. Cooperative agreements um, are similar to a grant, but with more involvement from the federal government. The government's involvement is typically described in specific terms. These cooperative agreements are legal instruments that transfer something of value from the federal government to the recipients for a public purpose. The role of a grant manager. We're here to help your organization successfully navigate the onboarding process. We're here to answer administrative and programmatic questions and concerns about award conditions. Um, we review all grant management GAMs and just grants and try to address any concerns and move forward um, with you for your final OVC approval. Um, sometimes, the GAMs take multiple levels of approval, um, depending on what type of awards you have. So always check with your grant manager um, if you're considering a GAM, whether it's a budget modification, whether you need to change the scope of the work that you're doing, um, please check with your grant manager. We're also here to work with you to ensure programmatic or financial changes are appropriately documented. Remembering that it's really important that you keep all documentation, that you also um, preserve um, any emails, um, letters um, between you and your grant manager also. We will also work with you and your TTA provider, which is a technical assistance provider to ensure you are receiving and requesting training and technical assistance, depending on what type of award um, you have. There are various TTA providers that your grant manager um, can work with you and your program to ensure that you get the support that you need to have successful outcomes for those who you are serving. It's also important for you to, um, for us to inform you of any events that we're having, any online resources, um, so that we can also support your programmatic requirements. Um, we're here to consult with your team on any programmatic changes, such as change to assist you with the change of scope, key personnel changes. We will refer you to helpful trainings, resources, guidance, and websites. And also we're here to highlight your grant successes and be an active support system. We often hear from grantees how important it is to hear from their peers 
about what is the most successful work that they are doing so that it can also assist them in providing the best um, services they can for those that they serve. Um, also, when we talk about OBC's expectations for you as grantees, um, we really need you to understand your notice of funding, um, any of your specific award conditions, I mean, your requirements for your award, that you be familiar with your project's goals, objectives, activities, deliverables, and application materials. You will be asked um, in your reporting requirements to talk to us about your project goals and objectives and activities, so along with keeping your data. We also expect you to work with your grant manager to successfully administer the grant award. And also we expect you to know how to navigate the different DOJ systems and locate existing supporting resources, guidance, guidance and support services. Now your grant manager is has a lot of resources at their fingertips. If you're having difficulty with just grants or with reporting requirements, um, and even if you just need to call your grant manager and talk about if you're having some type of issues with some of your programmatic objectives, um, we also want to ensure that we have good relationships with you and that you know you can reach out to us and we will be responsive. Some of the things that you do need is having some pre-approval um, when it comes to conference costs, and that's really for cooperative agreements only, um, your compensation for your consultant services, also um, any costs that are incurred prior to the date of the award. So it's important that you do not start obligating any funds to your award um, unless you've been notified that you have that final budget. If there are some nuances in there, you really need to reach out to your grant manager and talk through any of those issues. Um, also with your grant award modifications, like if you have a budget modification and you didn't calculate correctly how much your French benefits were, you cannot just start charging the new rate to those fringe benefits before you have a um, approved GAM. So those types of things, you wanna make sure you get approval through Just Grants and your grant manager. Also for project period extensions, if you find that you are coming towards the end of your grant and you aren't able to expend all of the funds, maybe you have staffing issues, there are different things that can happen. We wanna make sure that you have the opportunity to be able to complete any deliverables um, and expend those funds. So please um, keep aware of those dates and reach out to your grant manager months, I would say months ahead of time um, and not leave it till the last minute to try to get a project period extension. That also includes your scope changes if you, find that maybe something isn't working, one of your objectives or activities, and um, you would like to change those, you also have to do that through the GAM process, getting um, pre-approval from your grant manager. As far as um, conference cost approvals, um, which could include meetings, retreats, seminars, um, any kind of group training activity conducted by a cooperative agreement, recipients are contracted, funded by OJP, must receive written prior approval. If you are going to conduct or host a conference as a grant, a grant recipient of OJP funds, you must ensure that it is consistent with an approved grant budget and it is reasonable and necessary to achieve the goals and objectives with the grant. You absolutely wanna work with your grant manager in any of those cases. And remember, any conference costs um, approval must be submitted 120 days prior in advance to the start date. Conferences 
conducted by grant recipients do not require prior, appro prior approval. However, grant recipients must ensure compliance with the food and beverage meeting room audio visual. Um, if you're planning on paying a, a planner to assist you in it, um, there are limitations and there are cost thresholds. Again, this is where you want to have those types of conversations with your grant managers so that they can assist you through the process. Attached is a very important resource. Um, you want to make sure you have both of these um, so that the DOJ financial guide and also the 2 CFR 200 uniform guidance um, will assist you. And when you're looking at what you're doing with your grant funds, making sure that you are using them in a way that is consistent with what DOJ expects and what is in the CFR. So these are really two good resources. If you're starting off, you want absolutely want to make sure that you have them. Sorry, Joel, I went a little fast, but I you said we were running behind. We're and, running a little uh, behind. So thank we're you. Gonna push the, we're going to put the questions to uh, the end. Um, Daryl, put up the poll. Thank you, Janet. That's great. So, what is not a role of the OVC grant manager? Please answer the questions. We'll take about 30 seconds. All right, Daryl, let's pull them up. So we did to to assign. That's right. Uh, we cannot assign roles in um, just grants and or through diamond. That is done through your entity administrator. They're the only ones who have the power. And so it's important that before they leave, if they if they took on a new job, they assign that role to the new person. It's it's very hard to uh, work through and get that reassigned after the fact. All right. Um, next one. And now I'd like to introduce Amanda Wilson. Thanks, Joel. Um, um, as Joel said, my name is Amanda Wilson, and I work for OVC in the Budget Operations and Performance Management Division. And today I'm going to give you a very high level look at the training and technical assistance, referred to as TTA, that is available to you as an OVC grantee. Next slide. OVC has 52 national TTA providers providing training and technical assistance for every program touched by OVC funding, with some available to the field at large. All of OVC's training and technical assistance is available to grantees free of charge. I imagine you all know what training looks like, but technical assistance may be new for a few of you. Technical assistance, referred to as TA, is individualized and customized support. TA available through OVC is provided by experienced subject matter experts and may be provided as one-on-one -on -one group consultation, coaching, or training. This support may be provided in person, over the phone or email, through virtual webinars and communications, or in a combination of multiple, multiple approaches. Next slide. OVC has TTA to support the work of each of our individual programs. TTA is available to assist grantees with providing quality services, successfully administering their OVC awards, and building capacity within their organizations and staff. When you join your division's specific new grantee orientation, you will learn more about the specific TTA providers and partners available to support your work. Next slide. One of OVC's TTA synergy you may have heard of is OVC's Training and Technical Assistance Center, also known as OVC TTAC. OVC TTAC provides customized training and technical assistance for victim service organizations and allied professionals virtually and in, per and in person. These services are available to grantees and non-grantees. OVC TTAC works with subject matter experts with lived experience on a variety of topics, including trauma-informed services, vicarious trauma prevention, victim-centered practices, and much more. Highlights of OVC TTAC includes the National Victim Assistance Academy, vital subjects and expert Q&A webinars, 
and many more addressing emerging trends and providing tools and resources for the field. OBC TTAC provides progressive training opportunities for all levels of professional development from newly hired advocates, mid-level managers or directors, and even leadership development opportunities. OBC TTAC also works with multidisciplinary teams and local communities. Next slide. OBC also has training and technical assistance available to assist you in managing the financial aspects of your award, much of which you heard about today. The Financial Management Resource Center and the Tribal Financial Management Resource Centers are open to serve all OVC grantees, and you can connect with them directly at the websites listed here on the slide. We couldn't talk about training and education without some homework. As you process, process all the wonderful information you received today, take a moment to bookmark the OVC website where you will find the OVC Financial Management Center's contact information along with the OVC TTAC website. While you're bookmarking the OVC TTAC website, sign up for the mailing list to get information on upcoming training events and opportunities you can share with your colleagues and project partners sent directly to your inbox. Finally, connect with your OVC grant manager about your training and technical assistance needs. They are a great resource and can, can help you navigate the TTA process. The training and technical assistance available to you through OVC is a real benefit, an investment made by OVC to ensure you and your partners have the tools and information you need to serve survivors and successfully meet your award conditions and project goals. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Joel for final Q&A. Well, oh, thank you everybody for presenting. A lot of information. I know it's hard, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is kind of a one-on-one -on -one step. Um, we went over a lot of information, but those links, take your time with many of those links that are in the chat, in the slide presentation, any things that are referenced. Um, going over some of the like detailed budget work, I mean, going over budget clearances and things can be very complicated. So we don't expect you to learn everything in this uh, webinar, but hopefully we gave you the tools you need to be able to do your job effectively and have a successful grant with OVC during its performance period. So let's go over some of the questions that we have here. And I'll answer the first simple one. <clears throat> Quick question and just grants, why is my federal award amount listed in British pounds? The answer to that is I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> I've been here 20 years. Um, talk to your grant manager about that. It should not be listed in British pounds. And as far as I'm aware, OVC does not list um, awards in British pounds. Uh, could be some kind of typo error. You know how computers are. So uh, that one I am not aware of. Um, two, um, is the IDC, which stands for indirect cost rate and match amounts, will be reported as a cumulative, I guess cumulative is the worst, amount or what, or what belongs to the peer reported only. So in general, the, all information that's entered into your FFRs are cumulative. If you make an error in your match from the before, you can correct it in the next quarter FFR. Same with your indirect cost rates amounts. Um, they're always able to be changed until the final report. Once you submit the final report, then they cannot be changed unless uh, we reopen it for you. Um, but other than that, um, I'm, that's why I think, you know, everything that's entered in there is cumulative. Uh, let's see. With, for grants, for these grants, does not must, must the crime occur in the United States, or would the person still be eligible if they were victimized in another country? Um, I responded directly to the person, and that really depends on in, on the individual individual grants. OVC has many different grants, um, which can allow potentially uh, victimization overseas. We even have grants and programs specifically designed for international crime victims, uh, victims of terrorism as well as some of our formula grants, uh, some of the grantees will allow some, there are a few states that will allow some victimization of the countries to be paid for. So it really depends. Um, talk to your grant manager or look at your NOFO for more information on that. I, I assume, yes, there probably are a lot of examples. Human trafficking grants probably have a lot of examples where that can be. So um, work with your grant manager because every grant of God only knows, um, thousand plus grants that we have, um, it's possible that it, they could be um, allowable to provide services to. We, uh, let's see, 
Next one is from Jackie. We have June expenses that haven't been submitted yet because we just accepted our award. Can they still be submitted since July 31st has passed, the award acceptance 1015? So the answer to that one is in general, you cannot ask for expenses ahead of the award. There are exceptions to that. So the answer is talk to your grant manager about that. I know there are some ex examples of, of free expenses that can be paid for, but Please talk to your grant manager about that question that can help you most. Let's see. Um, how often must staff complete the financial management training? That is every three years. So Tina answered that one. So it's very important that you have, as I said before, 120 days um, from the acceptance of the award to take your um, training. I suggest you do it earlier. I mean, it's better, especially if there's a withholding special condition. Um, and that is good for three days. And most importantly, if you have new staff, they need to take the training. Common error is that they have new staff who have not taken the training. And when we do monitoring, we look and we see that um, the new person was not taking the training as required. So let's see. Um, let's go. I know we answered a lot of there. Again, progress report templates, there aren't necessarily something you can find online. PMT has these progress reports templates, either annual performance reports or um, semi-annual performance reports. Sometimes there may be a grant that is actually its performance measures are within just grants. I know I have one. Um, those are already usually pre-templated, so, pre so you can take a look and print those out ahead of time so you know what your um, deliverables and performance measures are. Again, if you have further questions, please go and ask your grant manager. They will assist you. And the NOFO is also a great example where you have your performance measures that you're probably going to be asked for. Maybe not word for word, but you'll have a general under idea and understanding. I, I'm not sure if I see any more that have not been answered. Did I miss? Let's see what's the last one here. Um, Apologies if this was not addressed as I was having audio issues. Are attendees able to get a certification of completion verifying attendance for today's webinar? No, the answer is this is not. Um, this is not a requirement that is part of your grant. We are glad you're here um, and we consider you, Rachel, as certified and so you can ask your grant manager, but we greatly appreciate your attendance and um, participation in this webinar. Um, one other question I saw was about, uh, is there a OVC national or, you know, a conference, yearly conference? And the answer is no, OVC does not have a yearly conference. However, each individual program piece may have something. Um, Indian Nations for some tribal grantees, Indian Nations conference, which will be held this December is every two years. VOCA formula grantees have actually an annual conference that's held usually in August or September. I know several other um, of the divisions also have larger meetings and or conferences related to their specific work. So if you have questions, ask your grant manager, and I'm sure that they'll be reaching out to you as well with emails about any type of those conferences that may be available. Or it could even be something smaller like a summit or regional training. Um, it really depends, as I said there, but the answer is no, there is not a annual uh, OVC VOCA national training. All right, well, we've gone over a little bit of time, so I think that's the last of the questions. I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, as Daryl had mentioned before, this will be posted probably sometime next week up online for uh, FireWay compliance in terms of putting the slides up. That'll probably take a little longer because it's requires some transcriptions and different things of that nature. Um, and we will also be trying very hard to work on getting a Spanish language version. Um, going to have to tackle some grant, some, some of our funding for LEP up on there and try to get that done. That will probably take a month or two, um, having done this before in the past. But we greatly appreciate your time. And as always, if you have any questions, please contact your grant manager. They are here for a reason, and OVC is always here to help and to make your transition to these new grants and or existing grants as smooth as possible to ensure we are serving crime victims nationwide. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Office for Victims of Crime and our panelists, we want to thank you for joining today's webinar. This will end today's presentation.